Um, so yeah, a lot of my work um, surrounds sort of omni specialization and imaginative form of design. So that's mostly where I'm going to be presenting from. And um, again, my name is Adi Melenciano. And um, to give context about me, even beyond um, maybe the biography that um, you shared with the students, um, I started off a lot with just art. That's the first thing I, I thought I was as a kid of just, I love to create with whatever was around me. I saw design and technology as these really powerful tools that take art into whole new domains, especially in, in, in interacting with humans and people in the world. And research has been something that I've been really fond of. of it allows me to understand a lot of different um, facets of life. And then I often merge all of these things into classes that I design and teach um, in different universities. And in being a teacher, I feel like I'm fortunate to always be a student. I, I love being in a classroom because I get to learn from my students and what they're doing. So I'll talk a bit about my electromedia practice, research pedagogy, and then building Afrotectopia, which is, um, I feel like a synthesis of a lot of the work that I've done. Um, and so with my electromedia practice or other people may call it creative technology or um, art and technology, I've started off a lot with sound just because sound has been a really exciting space for me to um, explore since I'm so familiar with it. I grew up around it. I'm a DJ. I've grown up playing classical music. So um, sound for me is a really special place to find ways to allow other people to uh, interact with it. I think one of my favorite parts of creative technology is that it removes that dichotomy between the artist and the viewer where when you create interactive elements, the people that are viewing it are then able to become an artist themselves as they interact with it. And so I love sound being a, a medium that they get to interact with. So for me, I was thinking a lot about um, structural spaces like architecture or sculpture. And I wanted to create these pieces where they had those sort of elements of like, it, it's a space where you can, it's a container for the mind and imagination, but then it's interactive. So I would infuse different um, sensors into them, like potentiometers or software potentiometers or photo transistors, so that as you interact with them, they would then change and produce different sounds. And so this one, I continued expanding on these ideas of sound sculptures. For here, I was thinking a lot about the future of Black culture. Um, in the States often, like these are Black culture artifacts that have existed for decades, like do-rags and bamboo earrings and hair rollers and afro picks. Um, and for me, they have such sentimental value because they're, they're items that I grew up with, I used, my friends used, my family used, um, but they often also have a very negative stigma um, when worn on black bodies. And I wanted to think of how can I remove that stigma? How can I remove that, that gaze, that structuring what it is um, and redefine it and recontextualize it in a whole new environment. So with this one, I was thinking about the future of black culture by creating these sound sculptures using black culture artifacts, but putting them in entirely different contexts. And then as you touch them, they produce different sounds, um, African drum pattern music, and it uh, and releases this kind of whole new world of this is what happens in the future um, with our artifacts. And so it would also be with hair, which is something that generally, you know, when you, you, it's never polite to touch a black person's hair. I don't know other races, but I know with black people, it's very impolite. Um, but this one allows you to touch a black, uh, black, a, braid what would seemingly come from a black person's hair and as you touch it again with the other artifacts it would change the sound and if you change the afro pics um this would actually they have dna like techno dna inside infused inside of the afro pics so as you change the afro pics the projection would change on the screen so it's kind of like this audio visual experience that people can interact with and um explore with a more recent project that i've done um, where I currently am in my lecture media practices, I'm often thinking about architecture within the digital environment. So how can we think about um, creating these virtual spaces that everyone can have access to, not inside of a VR headset, but through a, a web domain, a URL. And this was also at the time where I was thinking about the second wave um, of the Black Lives Matter uprising, of hearing constant protests outside my windows, um, and just being around them, being around protests, and um, hearing things constantly being said that could that is uh, could be harmful to the body, like saying constantly things like, I can't breathe, which is very cathartic when you're saying it in union and you're saying in response to horrific things that are going on, but also constantly saying those sort of things or become affirmations. So I wanted to think very critically about what is the what are the effects of turmoil and pain on the body? Like what, what happens when we consistently go through these really horrific and oppressive experiences? 
And so for me, I wanted to create a space that kind of reverses that. Generally, when you go through horrific experiences, whether it's you personally, someone in your generation, um, in your family, ancestrally, it's a form of epigenetics that can occur where it'll change, it could potentially change the structure of your DNA. And so I wanted to think about what, what would a positive epigenetic experience be where I can use sound and visuals to maybe align DNA um, in, a, in a healthier way, return it back to its healthier state. So I was thinking about sound and um, how there are different frequencies that tune into different energy centers or um, chakras as some may call it. And um, also African drum patterns, which have been used historically throughout Pan-African music, Pan-African revolutions, like the Haitian revolution and using things like talking jumps and the djembes, where they were actually able to communicate with one another, where slave masters couldn't understand what they were saying. So bringing in these two different major elements of um, history, historical and cultural alignment with also uh, scientific uses of sound, to create this experience. So researching what sounds um, tie to each sound energy center. Um, so what frequency would tie to each one, creating an environment, mapping it out. So thinking about the psychogeography of a space, which is the science of how a space allows you to feel when you're in it. So the construction, how um, walls may be curved and um, that allows for you to feel more calm. And then creating all the music, as I mentioned, I do a lot of sound production and design and then designing the space. So 3D rendering this environment that's colorful, that um, allows people, like higher ceilings allow you to feel like you're in the presence of something large and big. So creating that environment as well. And then as you move through this, and again, with the curves, um, you're hearing different sounds that are ideally uh, healing you in some form. So it's a web VR environment with spatialized sound. So as you get closer to these spheres, there's a red, orange, and a green and yellow. As you get closer to them, you hear the soundscapes rooted, um, tied to each of those chakras. So it might be the root chakra as you first enter and then you'll then hear the sacral and the one after. And so for me, um, as you see, a lot of research went into doing that project of studying different um, drum patterns, studying different sound frequencies, studying psychogeography, and then creating an environment, um, a virtual environment for that. But I also do, I continue to do research and sometimes I use it and sometimes I don't. Um, but more recently I was um, invited to work on a project through a fellowship at iBeam. Um, and so in that time, it's an art tech kind of um, center in New York City, um, in New York generally. And so in that time I was revisiting a lot of older readings and also reading new readings. Um, and generally a lot of the places that I'm exploring are pedagogy, I think, um, pedagogy, education, classroom environments are a really exciting space to explore because they don't have to exist. The learnings don't have to exist just inside of a classroom like we are in today in a virtual classroom, but they can exist on the street or in conversation. So it's something I'm always researching and exploring. And more recently, I've been studying Radical Indigenism. This is a beautiful book, um, Low Tech Design by Julia Watson, that surveys a bunch, a bunch of different um, a bunch of different indigenous groups around the world and the things that they're doing in relation to the earth and how they have this such powerful relationship and can utilize the elements in a way that's very natural and orderly. And then Hidden Life of Trees, which has also been a really fascinating book for me of understanding how trees and natural systems communicate and feel with one another. Um, but I feel like these also kind of uh, reflect the way that I approach my research practice. So it's a lot about understanding the entire system, about taking a step back and looking at the full picture. It's really never about me operating in a, in a siloed space of maybe to, um, I'm only going to study biochemistry and, and only focus on that. But instead, I'm going to study biochemistry and maybe hair products and corn rolling because all of them have some sort of relationship between each other. So um, Stuart Brandt, who is the creative Whole Earth Catalog, uh, I don't know if you've ever all have ever heard of him, but um, Steve Jobs is claimed was saying that the Whole Earth Catalog and Stuart Brandt are kind of like the um, genesis and beginning of what we know of Google today, of Steve Jobs and his practice of really looking at everything in one breath um, is something that I've been really drawn to because it's a way that I feel like a lot of us need to be exploring of thinking a lot about um, a variety of different information and seeing how they relate to one another. Um, and so it's, it's generally a realization that everything is connected. There's no need for us to separate different subjects. And I think in academia, we kind of do that just because of someone designed it to be that way. We have a, a, in our campus, we have a chemistry building, we have a sociology building, we have an anthropology building. Um, and it's just because someone decided that they wanted to separate things. But for me, it's really about how can we 
you know, flip that and not have a, a, a educational system where everything is separated. Um, so spaces that I've been exploring in my research practice are things like the Holder's Catalog, but also African Fractals, Modern Computing and Indigenous Design. And this one has been a particularly important book for me. Um, I read it more mostly during the summer, um, and it was mind blowing just to understand that I, I, oftentimes we think um, in a Western kind of society that the things that are going on in the continent of Africa are primitive or um, insufficient, but this book highlights and exposes how a lot of the technologies that we have today, even computers and the internet and every basically every technology that we have today, um, the math that we have today, a lot of it is originated in the practices of Africa. Africa, the, the settlements that they had, the design of their settlements um, were very different from how the European um, settlers and colonizers were coming to the continent. It was very different from how they were living in their own continent. Uh, when they came to Africa, they saw them all kind of like sprawled out and it looked odd and primitive to them, but really it was a fractal mathematics and the way that they dispersed communities. Um, so it was ahead of it, it was way ahead of um, European mathematics. And the only other place that was doing fractal, fractal mathematics was in India. Um, so to know that these kind of things were happening and now only, only now in the, the quote unquote Western world in the 80s have we really been um, studying fractal geometry when it was existing, you know, decades, centuries before that in Africa. Um, and just the ways that math can is included in or considered or, or infiltrated or even originated in the um, designs of Africa, like corn rolls or games like Mancala. I don't know if any of you have ever played Mancala, but I grew up playing that of um, how so many elements of the African culture is rooted in math. And I think that was really important to learn about. Um, and so, as I mentioned, I was uh, selected as a fellow for um, IBEAM and it's a space where you're thinking very critically about art and technology and the task for this fellowship was how can we, uh, it was exploring surveillance capitalism. So surveillance capitalism, capitalism as we know it is generally the way that the internet is constructed today. It knows everything about you and it can make money off of that. And so for me, I was thinking of surveillance capitalism in a way where how can we evade that surveillance capitalism where um, it's not so well designed that it knows who you are. It knows what you wanna do. It knows what you're interested in. But instead, there's some room for spontaneous discovery. And I was also thinking about um, sort of how I was studying those low tech radical indigenism, the book and uh, trees, the hidden life of trees. Um, what, how can we return technology to its natural elements? Technology is something that has existed forever, um, but it's so removed from um, biomimicry, the way that the world is designed. How can we use biomimicry to redesign a whole, a whole internet experience? Um, and also thinking about the internet, not as a sort of utilitarian, purely utilitarian tool where I go onto the, to um, my domain and I type in something I'm looking for and then I go on that website and that's it. But instead, how can it be an experience? How can we move through information, embody information, embody pedagogy, um, create new forms of communication? So those are, these were thinking things that I was generally thinking a lot about. And so I was, again, was returning to even more research of things like socialism, um, and socialism and trees are things that I found a really strong relationship between of um, socialism is a lot about you taking care of everyone's taking care of each other and trees of same species they take care of each other so it's for me it's helpful to find different um, things that are patterns it's a lot of pattern recognition between different um, research so also another book places of the heart which was the first book that I read on psychogeography. So returning back to that, if, if I wanna create a whole new experience in the internet, how can I think about it psychogeographically? Uh, geography, how do you even say that word? Psychogeographically um, <laughs> and um, a bunch of other books that I, I mentioned earlier, the pneumatic architecture or designing club culture, all of these different spaces, politics of design, and design as you are all the design students, um, I hope you all have read that or will be reading that. I think that's a, a incredible collection of work by Victor Papanek. Um, and so for me, something that I found was, as I was doing my research, I also found this quote that um, tied very well to what I was attempting to do, which says the only humane and effective way to break the negative grip of anti-culture is with information. And I think that's often what we're lacking, especially in the States. I don't know how it is with you all, but we are extremely polarized over here um, politically. And I think a really important thing that we need to do is Surveillance capitalism also contributes to eco chambers. And you kind of think everyone thinks like you do. 
And it, it's really important for us to, how, how do we get away from that and just expose a lot of different information to people and they don't know the political background of it. So you're not, you know, you don't have this barrier and you're not looking through a specific lens, but you're just being exposed to information. So um, as a student of architecture, I study architecture and I'm thinking about how can I bring it into digital environments and I'm creating these environments um, for online exploration. So I'm, I'm bringing in a lot of the architectural work that I'm designing and then I'm putting it into the web and thinking of how can it then become different portals. So as people are engaging with these architectural elements where it's not, it's no longer this flat faced 2D hyperlink kind of um, way of navigating through the web, but instead it's you're entering these portals, these architectural spaces. And as you enter a portal, maybe it leads to um, an area that's collapsing information on environmentalism and Dadaism, or you're moving into another space and that space is thinking critically about um, it has a bunch of information related to quantum mechanics with sound design. So it's just like they're all merging different pieces of information together um, in spaces that you would never imagine them really to being combined. Um, but generally, I share this research on Omni Specialized Design in something like this. It's a presentation. So I give a few slides. So with you all being designers, I'm happy to share a few things that I've studied in Omni Specialized Design for beautiful futures. Um, because I think there are, there are a lot of elements of design that we practice that can be very dangerous and it's important to think critically about how are we engaging with the world. We're, we're really just a conduit between um, the arts and the world as designers. So how can we make sure that we're creating spaces that are healthy? Um, and one quote that I found um, that I learned of, I think probably the beginning of this year that I've just been so drawn to is of Benjamin Bratton, who's a theorist and philosopher saying, the job of design in the 21st century is to undo much of the design of the 20th century. Um, or 20th. And so how can we think as designers and, and creators and innovators that uh, of how we can make sure that the, the world that we're living in is actually uh, healthy and beneficial to all of us. And oftentimes um, we kind of just take the system as it is, take the status quo as it is because it's implemented and everyone practices it. But um, speaking from the perspective of the states, I think with our second wave of uprising and revolts that are going on, I think people are really, there's a, there's a strong element of anarchy where people are realizing their own agency and power. And so a lot of structures are being challenged. And I think that's exactly how we need to remain of constantly challenging systems and making sure is this healthy for us or is it not? Um, and realizing that someone else, some human created this system before us. So inherently it is, there is some fault and error within it. So it's important that we realize it's not a perfect system and there's always room for improvement. And so within this presentation, I usually, within the, my Omni, um, Omni specialization um, for imaginative design, I usually talk about the rethinking design. So what is the role of a designer? What principles are we building design off of and what are ways that we can design? And so the role of a designer, um, speaking from the book that I mentioned earlier, Politics of Design with Victor Papanek, it says design has to be done by a team. This team must not consist of only somebody who is a designer. It must consist of people of other disciplines. And I think this is really important because um, I, I see a lot of design teams engage with each other. And oftentimes there might be a few architects, an urban designer, and then maybe like some sort of just general designer. And they're, they're the ones that are creating this new neighborhood. <laughs> Whereas they're not thinking about all the other um, people that are involved in what might happen when they create this. And so Victor also says the most important team member besides the designer is a member of the user group. He says user group, but um, being a technologist, user is something I try and stray away from because user is very common. The word user is very common in, in tech talk. And it often, for me, it kind of flattens the dimensionality of the person on the receiving end, it feels like um, you're just you're just looking at them as someone that's um, just on the other side of this technology. So, for me, I try and think of other words to replace it, and one being intended beneficiary of understanding that this is this is a human being, this is a sentient um, being that's on the receiving end of this. And so, I think that's really important, though, beyond the semantics. Um, the most important team member again is the person that is on the other side of this product, who is going to um, who is intended to benefit from this, and I think. Oftentimes in design work, we think, okay, we've been trained to design because we went to this procedure school and we you know, had all these great professors that taught us all about designing. We've practiced a lot in our college 
through theory and now we're going into an actual space and we're designing for these people and i think that's the biggest fault you can do of thinking that you're designing for a group of people and thinking that because you have some sort of training that you 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 have this like power but really it, it takes a lot of humility to be a designer if you're doing it well and you you should be entering spaces and looking at the people that are in these spaces and most familiar with spaces as the most um, the biggest experts that you can talk to and they're the most important group person uh, group member within your your team they need to be a part of your team um, to guide your work and so as as was mentioned in the quote before the designer is generally just this um, bridge between a bunch of different disciplines so it's important to have a lot of different disciplines within your design team of a historian an artist and community member an engineer and scientist and the designer is basically trying to create some sort of shared language amongst everyone so it's about designing with and not for, which is really, really important. And what principles are we designing um, off of? And since, since European enlightenment and industrialization and capitalism, the idea of design has changed drastically from the way that it originated. And there's this sort of mythology of technology that Julia Watson expands on very well in the Low Tech Radical Indigenism book where technology kind of exists within the intersections of humanism, current technology does, and the intersections of humanism, colonialism, racism, which inherently produce um, capitalism. And so that's kind of where it is now. And that's where design is building off of, but really it's been severed from its indigenous innovations, ancestral intelligence and local wisdom. So we're, we're creating technologies and design practices off of hyper capitalism hyper production all of these sorts of things and not really thinking about all of the people that have been thinking so critically about the world and technology and design in ways even beyond computation but just like the built environment um, and so we really need to return to that of what have indigenous people been doing all this time what's the local wisdom what's the ancestral intelligence um, and Dory Turnstall, I feel like, um, has, I, I just love a lot of the, the quotes that she has that I found. Dory is the Dean of Ontario College of Art and Design um, in Canada. And she says, why are we creating these boundaries between the human and the non-human and the floor and the fawn and the supernatural? Are there other values or principles that we can take into account that will bring us closer as opposed to creating divisions? Because for a really, really long time, we've been designing with the exclusion of all other life forms. And I think this is also an element of design that has occurred because of enlightenment and industrialization, where we think we're only thinking about ourselves. We're thinking about us as human beings on this planet, and how can we create the best situation for us possible? And we have no consideration for the trees in our neighborhood or um, the insects that are you know, in the grass or anything else. Um, and so there's a huge barrier between our design practice and a design practice that's thinking very considerately of the rest of the world. And so for me, I really wanted to push back on this idea of human-centered design. I think that's it's a great philosophy when you're thinking about things like technology that are meant to be in the hands of humans. But I think we're taking human-centered design way too far and we're thinking about human-centered design with everything. And for me, it's really important to push this idea of ecologically-centered design. How can we not consider ourselves as the center of the universe, but think of the whole ecology and how can we make sure we're designing for that? Um, and so generally my research and practice, um, pedagogy and research is interdisciplinary because I feel like it feels, it gives a much fuller picture. And when we return to this idea of like campuses and colleges and how you have a science building here, a chemistry building here and a um, public policy building here, it's the way that that is designed is because there's a sort of assumption that sciences are like this apolitical, purely objective thing. But when we look at sciences in relation to humanities, we're seeing that science is always political. The way that we interpret what's happening and scientifically, there is some sort of politics of a political lens that's being observed through that. And humanities, it's always important that we're looking from a variety of different perspectives, because oftentimes I think with anthropology, which I think if you if you research more and more is a it can be an incredibly racist practice because it's usually white people, maybe European people that are studying every other group of people and they're giving their understanding. And then that's kind of like the law of what this group of people is and how their community is. And it's very rarely people of non-European, non-white people that are studying other people and giving their perspectives of them. Um, so there's generally a lack of perspectives within humanities. So um, there's this idea of cybernetics, which is like the, the seed of artificial intelligence. And cybernetics was this idea that if you, there's a sort of feedback loop that always exists between systems. And so if this happens and this happens and this will then create this product. Um, and, that, and that was a really strong field within computer science. But then people like Margaret Mead, an anthropologist, looked at what was going on with cybernetics and said, 
well, actually there's a, there's a whole other element that's existing within that. And um, that is the, the element is the perspective of the, of the viewer. So the viewer is looking at this feedback loop and they're having their own interpretation of that. And so her stepping back from this idea of cybernetics and looking at the viewer and their interpretation became what is known as second wave cybernetics. And I feel like um, there's a, there's a, often we're not thinking about humanities as a form of second wave cybernetics where humanities is really just the observation of the viewer. And I think it's really important to emphasize that of we need to have a lot of different viewers that are stating their perspectives and we need to be studying from that. So the courses that I design and teach, um, like the revolution will be digitized, um, which is again on the same similar vein of we need to bring in a lot of different um, facets of life together to create something that's comprehensive and full pictured. So the revolution will be digitized. Um, it's based off of the, the music by Jill Scott Heron, which is called The Revolution Will Not Be Televised. Um, and I also bring in elements like club culture or um, counterculture, so hippies in the 1970s that were also working in some of the biggest tech um, institutions. You know, they, like there was this really weird thing going on where hippies who were trying to remove themselves from the world and living communes, we're now returning to some of these most elite institutions and creating what we know of today as the internet. And then people like Norbert Wiener, who was the creator of cybernetics, as I mentioned before. So thinking a lot about different areas like ecology and economics and design and tech and public policy. And then I also have design and club culture, which is another course I taught. Um, I teach and design. I design the class and then teach at New York University. Um, and it's all kind of on the flip side of the revolution we digitize, where the revolution is really about the societal impacts of tech, whereas design at cl club culture is really about um, this, these you know, new curiosities and fascinations and surprises and, and um, just exciting things that are happening at the intersections of counterculture, which are generally like LGBTQ environments and Black people and Latinx people and all these oppressed groups of people that were using technology and design and architecture to create these whole new participatory utopias in the form of clubs um, from the 60s to today. And so I'll wrap up with how all of these things, all these general practices also kind of feed into my work in building Afrotectopia. Um, so in, while I was a graduate student at um, New York University, I decided I wanted to create a space that was thinking very critically about race and technology because in my program, it was very um, obsolete. Like we weren't really thinking very critically about race. I had very few black classmates, maybe you know a handful out of the hundreds of overall classmates that I had, no full-time faculty. Like there was a, a, a big uh, gap in racial um, understanding within the program. And I think that also exists generally within academia and especially within technology. So I wanted to create a space where we could be black people together, um, innovating and ideating and considering a new world where maybe technology is at the center of it and it's digital form or in a whole other form, but we're generally thinking about how we can create systems for healthy futures. And so it sold out quickly after it was announced. Uh, the first one happened in 2018. And then we had other ones happening. Um, we had a summer camp in 2019. So it's, it's morphed outside of being a festival, but also into a camp. The second festival happened at Google in 2019. It morphed into also an alternative adult school. So we had a, um, adults teaching classes and adults taking classes. We had about 250 students and this was hosted by Verizon Media. And we were thinking again about the same pillars of Aftertopia, which is rooted in art, design, technology, black culture and activism. And so all of these classes were surrounding um, all of these different ideas. So we had one person teaching computing climate change and black futurity, another person teaching um, getting into public policy and then data mapping and projection mapping and 3D rendering. And so another space that it's morphed into is into a fellowship. And this has been one of the most exciting um, forms Afrotopia has taken for me. I just feel like it's very aligned with what I've been wanting it to be for so long. And so this fellowship, um, it was a month and a half long. Each fellow got a thousand dollars of a stipend and it was open to the entire you know, world. Anyone could apply. And so the fellowship um, was created because I wanted to think very strategically about individualism versus community. And I think as someone that does a lot of different residencies, because it's just a really great way for me to um, sustain my own creative practice, it's often you're given some sort of lump sum of money and then you go off in your own corner and you build and then you come back and you present what you did. 
Um, but I wanted to think about how that could exist outside of this individualist framework and instead be um, a communal practice. So it wasn't where, you know, everyone was giving a lump sum of money, but we were coming all together. And then it's also an omni specialization of Black futures. So um, it was about making sure that this cohort of people were as diverse as possible in their studies and practices. So we had people that were um, on the ground doing community organizing and facilitation to people that were creating 3D uh, renderings to game developers, to architects and designers, to digital humanity, PhD students, to machine learning scientists. Um, so a huge array of practices. And then also respecting the fact that blackness is not a monolith. And I think um, there's also often generally an assumption with whatever um, ethnic group that is considered an other is that they, they all kind of have a shared way of being. And, and that's especially considered in the States for black people. Um, and for me, I wanted to tap into that of, under, of expanding on the nuance within blackness. Uh, so we had people that were from a variety of different cultural backgrounds. So we had an Afro-Cuban, a Haitian, a Beninese, a French person, Honduran, a British person. So even though we all have the shared racial identity, but which is imposed on us politically, we have a very understanding of who we are and the way that we practice in our culture. And it was about making sure that all, as many voices as possible was being considered within our work. And then it's from a prismatic um, set of perspectives. So it's not about all of us being academics who are in the middle of our develop, working on our PhD projects. And we all came from a shared socioeconomic background because then we're still having a very limited lens in the things that we're creating. So it was instead about people from having a group of variety of people. So we had someone that was queer. We had a few people that were queer, cisgender, fluid, non-binary. We had people that were working class, the people that were upper class and middle class. We had um, people with a variety of different educational levels and from all over um, the, the country and the world. And I've started this fellowship in presenting to the fellows that my personal philosophy is that um, and it's something I've ingrained into Afrotopia is technology is merely an extension of human capability. And we often think that technology is synonymous with digitality or computing, but it's not. It's existed for so long. And that ties back into this last slide I, I showed you earlier of this idea that you know there's a myth of technology that exists in these centers, but really it's ancestral intelligence and local wisdom and all of those sorts of things. And if we get out of this human-centered design that I mentioned earlier, Technology is merely an extension of sentient capability. So ants and butterflies and caterpillars and all of these other things, they're using their own forms of technology as well. Every living thing is using some form of technology to make its life just a little bit easier. And so the fellows, they came from all over the states, from every part of the states. We had West Coast, East Coast, North, South. They came from the UK, from Ghana, and from France. And so in the fellowship, um, what, as I was having interviews with people that wanted to be a fellow, um, I, I saw a common thread of everyone really just wanted a space to come together and learn amongst each other. And so with that, um, because I couldn't, I, we didn't have the funding to you know, fund hundreds of people to do this, I realized just a, a sufficient way to, um, to you know, fill these people's needs is just creating a public space where they can gather. And so that was in the form of, of an imaginarium. So the structure of the fellowship, we had these different projects that they, the fellows worked on for each week. And then the imaginariums would also work on those projects each week, but it was open to the black public for free. So we would have a guest speaker come in, they would share their work. Um, and then I would um, then I would create a map where people can write down their different ideas and they would break up into different groups and they would write down their ideas and then we'll come back together in a collective conversation and, um, you know, discuss it. So as I mentioned, the guest speakers, we had a lot of really prolific people that are working at the exact areas that we were studying for that week and they would present their work for 20 minutes. They would, you know, write down their ideas and um, in response to what we heard and also the prompt questions that I had. And then we would come together for like these very vibrant conversations. And we had people from a variety of different ages, from all over the world and country and from, you know, a variety of different backgrounds. And we were just reflecting and thinking about what is this new world that we want to live in. Um, and so the goals for the fellowship were to build an, a vibrant, international, multidimensional Black micro community of innovators. So it's really about how can we continue to build community, which is the most important part of Afrotectopia. Another was how can we contribute to and create healthy visions of black futures from um, 
a prismatic collection of perspectives, which is the most important part in making sure that it's not this one small little group that's creating these futures for the entire Black society, but how can we make sure that this group is as diverse as possible within their Blackness? And it really just showing people in our society that this is a space that we can live in. We don't have enough spaces like this where we can just imagine, so it's creating that sort of space. And then all the work that we did was open source. So, um, you know, developing open source interdisciplinary pedagogy. So everyone can have any, any of you and anyone that's interested has access to our syllabus that's online, all the readings that we did, the work that the fellows did, the notes that they took, the conversations that they had, all of that is available online. And the fellowship, um, the projects that we were doing were future protests, designing future cities, Black Futures Manifesto, all of these different spaces. As I mentioned, the syllabus is available online. We reflected on readings every week. We had guest speakers come in also with and only for the fellows. So one was Rafael Sergio Smith, who was the design director at IDEO, and he was talking about solar powered reparations. And so they would just, you know, bring in all these different really exciting people that were thinking um, and that would contribute to their work. And then all of the fellows would then at the culmination of the fellowship, they would write an essay in reflection of their experience and the research that they had done. Um, and these are also available online. And then for me, um, they're just like such gifts because they're so beautiful and, and so well written and so imaginative. And um, I highly suggest just reading through them and seeing the things that they were thinking. Um, so the, the main goal for Afrotopia and for a lot of my work personally too is just plant seeds for radical black imagination. Let's just design these new worlds. Let's stop uh, have feeling the need that we need to oppose the opinions of everyone else and what they think we should be doing. But it's really how can we just create and build our futures um, and, and speculate. So I just wanna leave you all with a few um, philosophies that just carry me through a lot of the work that I do, which is always create space for imagination. It's manifestation. The more you imagine and think critically about what is this world that you wanna live in? What's, what do you wanna do in a few years? You know, what your, what's your career? Imagine it, just keep ideating on it because it becomes, it manifests itself. And that everything is fluid. There are no silos. So as you engage in your practice, design practice and creative practice, there, you have room to do whatever, bring in whatever you want to do. Um, there's always, a, there's always can be a relationship between it if you, if you find it um, and seek it. So thank you. And you can, um, you know, learn more about the work in these social channels.